Good morning, Walden Church. Hey, you've heard the expression, that's life, right? Yeah. Something bad happens, something unexplained happens, and then we just shrug our shoulders and say, eh, that's life, because that seems to be the dominant narrative, that this, all of this, this is how it is, and consequently, this is how it's always going to be. My doorbell rang one Halloween, and I went to open the door. Nobody was there. I looked around, walked out, looked around the corner, and there, hiding in the bushes, was my uncle with a hose. And he proceeded to turn it on me and get me wet as a joke. My uncle was a jerk. <laughs> and I could say, well, that's my uncle. That's how he is. But can people change? That's a good question. Psychiatry has tried to answer this question. Uh, the drug age tried to answer this question. There's hundreds of podcasts and blogs and diets and exercise programs that you can do. People give you the tools for change. But can the old truly go away to make room for the new? That's what we're all searching for, usually at the beginning of a new year. That's why we make a New Year's resolution. Because in life, it seems to be that the answer is no. Change is hard. You know, we said last week, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And for the most part, we believe it. And now that it's 2022, I want to talk about that change. I want to talk about a new life. Because the Christian life should be all about a new life. Jesus steps onto the scene in the Middle East. He is preaching a ministry, and he says, no, it doesn't have to be the same old way. It can be new. It can be different. And Jesus starts to use the words, born again. But how do you take something like rebirth? How do you take a concept like change and then make it knowable? How do you make it touchable and believable for your audience? How do you take a concept like new life and then make it visible for people to see? This is why images and symbols are important. You know, we saw this last week. Jesus took physical things like bread and wine and he made them symbols. And then for thousands of years, people have looked at flat bread and they've looked at wine and they've called it the flesh and blood of Jesus. And then through this symbol, we learn deeper truth. So today, I wanted to do a couple of things. First, I want to look at baptism and what it teaches us, what it's a symbol of. And second, I wanted to begin our study in the book of Matthew. We're going to look at Matthew for the first four months of this year. And going back through all the different studies that we've done together, we, we've studied Mark, we've studied Luke, we've studied John, we even did the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew, but never Matthew itself. And so, since the Christmas story we just familiarized ourselves with, we all read it together, the next big story in Matthew is John the Baptist. So, it works out perfectly. Matthew chapter 3 says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, when he said the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. This is a really great place for us to be at the beginning of a new year. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, which means it's the first book that follows Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. And just for fun, we can go a couple chapters back into Malachi and see how Malachi ends. Malachi 4 verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So in Malachi 4, God promises he's going to send a prophet, a prophet who will be like Elijah. And then we have the gap that takes place between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 400 years, 400 years of silence. And then after the silence, John the Baptist. He is the first one 
to step out onto a quiet, empty stage. Now, we could introduce John the Baptist, we could talk about him, but Jesus could actually introduce John better. In Matthew 11, it says, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah, who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus confirms, right? Jesus validates this symbol of who John the Baptist is. John is the prophet, Elijah, that Malachi told us about, and who Isaiah told us about. Isaiah 40 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Who is he? Who is John the Baptist? He is the herald for the king. He has a trumpet. He shouts, The king is coming! Right? Make his path straight. And what else? Would, is, he an, is he an ordinary king, John? No, he's not an ordinary king. John says he's the Lord. And what about his appearance? What does John the Baptist look like? Verse 4 says, Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So he wears camel's hair and a belt. John dresses very simply. Why did John dress this way? Because he was, you know, of the earth, trying to live off the land, trying to set a new fashion statement? No, nothing in the Bible is by accident. It's all by design. The second king says that uh, a man came to meet us, they replied, and he said to us, go back to the king who has sent you and tell him this is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending messengers to consult Baal and the God of Ekron? Therefore, you will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So a messenger comes with a word of warning. A strange messenger comes with a word of judgment. The king asked them, what kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this? They replied, he had a garment of hair and a leather belt around his waist. And the king said, that was Elijah, the Tishbite. John wears these clothes because he's costuming as Elijah. He wears these clothes because God doesn't want anyone to miss it. God doesn't want anyone to miss this moment. Get ready. When you see Elijah, you should know what's coming next. And what's coming next? What is John doing? What's, what's John's whole ministry? Verse 5 says, Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. It was baptism, right? He is John the baptizer. John the dunker, Right? In our church, as well as others, uh, we have taken baptism, this practice, and we've elevated it to something that we call an ordinance. An ordinance is a church tradition that we all observe because we feel it was ordered by Jesus. Our church actually has two ordinances, as do most churches, uh, communion that we talked about last week, and baptism. And for the most part, baptism is really introduced here to us in the New Testament. I mean, at first glance, we don't see any evidence of baptism until John the Baptist. And one might say, well, where did baptism come from? Did, did John make it up? No, he did not make it up. John's parents were both Levites. In fact, his father was a priest. John's a, a pastor's kid. 
And so John would have been very familiar with the symbols of his faith. And while it's true that baptism itself is not in the Old Testament, much of its beginnings are still there. In the Old Testament, there's a lot of references to ceremonial washing, using water to purify yourself so that you can either enter into the Lord's presence or so that you are allowed to enter back into the community. And at the time of Christ, baptism was practiced by the Hebrews, but it was practiced uh, on the Gentiles. So you would baptize a Gentile to convert them to Judaism. You'd be washing off the Gentile. And when John steps onto the scene, that's not what he's doing. John's John's baptism is new. It's different. Early on, we see John's baptizing in the Jordan River. It's public. And in Jesus' day, most ceremonial washing was done in the home. It was done in private. Plus, the Jordan River is dirty. I mean, it's filthy. It still is. In fact, if you accidentally fell in the Jordan, you would have to go home and then ceremonially wash yourself just to become clean again. Verse 4 says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So this is not just a washing. It's not outward dirt. And it's not only for Gentiles. The Bible says all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him. So we see John. He's baptizing out in the open. He's having people come down into a river to immerse themselves. And his message is right there in verse 2. It's right at the top of the page. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent is such a, it's such a Bible word, isn't it? It conjures up this extended accusatory finger and a, and a, a wickedly raised eyebrow. Repent, right? But Jesus uses the word repent. Jesus says in John 17, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Repent is the Greek word metaneo. And it literally means to change your mind. It means you turn around. You realize you're going in the wrong way, and then you make a U-turn. And so for the Christian, it means a couple of things. And I thought we could go over those right now. Psalm 51 says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. That's the process. The process is contrition, conversion, confession. And they're all linked together. It's all part of the same process. Contrition is you feel sorry for your sin. Confession is you admit your sin. And then conversion is you turn away from your sin. Another way of describing that is someone who realizes their own issue, right? They realize their own sin. They are moved to feel sorrow for it. And then they are moved to correct it. 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John first says, repent, right? Repent, turn around. Why? Why repent? Well, because the kingdom of God is at hand. So change I want you to change because the king is coming. The lamb of God that we talked about last week. The lamb of God is coming. Okay, but obviously then John's message is for Gentiles, right? Non-Christians, right? Sinners. Now, verse 5 says, Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. John's baptizing Hebrews. Something that was normally done for Gentile conversion, now it's being done for Jews. And he says in verse 7, or it says in verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance? And do not presume to say to yourselves, oh, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to take these stones and raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of that tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John is pointing that accusatory finger at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. John is chewing out 
the religious leaders. He is choosing out the Hebrews who are literally the most revered and the most respected. And he calls them a brood of vipers. Literally, he's calling them, you children of snakes. John says, you you say that you're children of Abraham and and you think that's going to save you? Big deal. God's going to cut down that tree because that tree no longer produces fruit. That's what we do with dead things. And if God wanted to make more children of Abraham, he could make more out of rocks. Repent. Your teaching is breeding lies. You are telling the Gentiles to earn their righteousness through good works, through acts. And you think that because you were born into a religious family, that saves you from judgment? You think that just because you know what you were you you act religious that that saves you from the fire repent your parents are christian you are raised in a christian home so what the bible says you need to repent you were baptized as a child went to sunday school your whole life so what you need to repent We are all personally, individually called to repent and to follow Jesus. Baptism is you renouncing your old life and all your your worldly accomplishments and just putting those all to death, dying to self, and then you raise up to new life. I think the Apostle Paul says it the best. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. There's your pattern. There's your pattern. There's your definition of what baptism is. It's death, burial, new life. I mean, you've heard that something that's important right? You say, oh, this is important. It's a matter of life and death. Baptism is literally a matter of life and death. Paul says baptism is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. Death. The Bible says in Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And a little later in 623, it says, for the wages of sin is death. Look, the only reason you would ever try to change your life is because you feel like you aren't living the life that you want. Or better yet, There is something in all of us that says there is a better life and I am not living the life that I was made for. The Bible calls this falling short. It's a picture of you reaching. It's a picture of you jumping as high as you can and no matter how long your grasp is, you can never reach it. You're always missing it. And when you miss it, the Bible says that's sin. And so for all those times we've missed out on the life that we were meant for, those mistakes, those errors, they become the darkness in our life. Our past becomes shadow, it becomes a pit. We walk around with shame and regret and insecurities and weaknesses and faults and all of those hidden things. On all those things, they, they, they fester in us, they rot in us, and we live with it. But we don't die. Sometimes we want to, we wish we could, we feel like we deserve to die, but it doesn't happen. Because death is not how Romans 6 ends. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says, yes, there is darkness in your life, but there is another way. There is another life, a life where you don't die. You see, Jesus died, and Jesus never had darkness. That means he paid the price for something that we earned. He took the penalty. We believe in him. We accept him. And now we don't have to live with that penalty. Last week we said communion is a remembrance of Christ's death. So is baptism. And so baptism is a little more though. It's not just simply remembering Christ's death. Baptism is identifying with Christ in his death and that's the difference. Baptism is a, is a physical symbol of the fact that you've died and you died with Christ. 
And that old life that you used to live is buried. It's buried. Paul says in Romans 6, 4, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. People in Jesus' day were pushed under the water as a symbol of burial. And, and, and here is where I think the submersion aspect of baptism is so important because the price of sin is death. So baptism symbolically takes you underground, right? It puts you beneath the surface. So it becomes the symbol that your past life, the darkness that existed before Christ, has been put to death. Paul says earlier in Romans 6, verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. That part of you that's dark, that's wicked, that's evil, it dies with Christ. And because it's dead, it's buried. Something that's dead gets buried and it never gets seen again. It doesn't come back to life. It's never unearthed. So the good news is that all the old life, the old ways, the old things that you couldn't change, all that frustration, all that heartache, it all gets buried under water and then you come up out of the water and what waits for you now is new life. Yes, of course, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But see, with Christ in you, the old you is dead. You are not an old dog anymore. 1 Corinthians 15 says Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus died and God raised him from the dead. And when we join with him in his death, we can be assured that we will also have new life in him. Listen to how Paul describes it in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says this new life that I'm living now, it's not even me anymore. God used to live in a temple, and now he lives in me. And this isn't some abstract idea. It's not some faraway promise. Paul's talking about the present, lived in, everyday life. Paul's talking about his today life, a life that you can claim and live right now, in the present. Baptism is a symbol, yes, but it's a symbol of a present reality. Death and darkness give way to burial and water, which then brings us to resurrection, which brings us to new life. Going back to Matthew, before we close, we see something interesting. Jesus is baptized by John. In verse 13, it says, Then Jesus came from the Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Why does Jesus need to be baptized? Because as the Son of God, he has not sinned. Even John refuses to go through with it. He says, no, 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 you need to baptize me. But Jesus was baptized because he was a leader. And he was a leader who led by example. Jesus would never ask you to do something that he isn't willing to do himself. And so as followers, as his disciples, we follow. Why should you be baptized? Well, to follow the example that Jesus set. Why was Jesus baptized? In order to save him? No, he didn't need to be saved. He was perfect. But baptism doesn't save you either. It's a symbol of our obedience. You should also be baptized because Jesus commands it. Christ commands that every Christian be baptized. In Matthew 28, Jesus says, Go tell all the people, every 
and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. There are three, three things right there that every church is commanded to do. Make disciples, help them come to know Christ, and baptize them. And, and you know, there's people that think, well, I don't know, I'll, I'll get baptized after I learn more about this. I'll, I'll get baptized when I feel more like a Christian. I'll get baptized when, I'm, when, I, when I know more about my faith, after I've grown up. Then I'll get baptized. No. Baptism comes first. It comes first. It's right after you make the decision to follow Christ. Notice the order in Matthew 28. You make the disciple, and then you baptize them. And then you spend the rest of your life growing as a Christian. Why else should you get baptized? Well, it demonstrates that I'm a believer. The Bible says in Acts 18.8, many of the people who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Look, baptism doesn't make you a Christian. It just shows others that you are a Christian. Just like your wedding ring. The wedding ring does not make you married, but it's a symbol of a commitment that I made when I got married. On January 1st, in the year 2000, I made a commitment to my wife before God and a bunch of other people, and I said, I do, and I gave my life to her. That commitment is what makes me married. The promise makes me married, not the ring. If I were to lose this ring, I would still be married. It's an outward symbol of an inward truth. It's your commitment to Christ that saves you. And when you obtain that new life, you are saved. And if you're saved, then you would naturally want to tell others. You would want to share that with them. Baptism, just like communion, is the profession of faith. John baptized in a public place. Philip baptized the eunuch out in the open. Here at Walden Church, we believe every member is a minister. And so when you're baptized, you're preaching a sermon. In doing so, you make a public announcement to everyone around you. I identify with Christ in his death and burial and resurrection. I die to my old self and I'm reborn to new life. Right? Lastly, I would add that if you were baptized as a child or you were sprinkled with water instead of being submersed, I don't want you to feel like that experience has no value. If you cherish your baptism and it has relevance and meaning to you, that is all that matters. Personally, I believe that a believer's baptism is one of the most beautiful things a Christian can experience. And not just for you, but for the entire church as well. And so if it's something that you're thinking about, if baptism is something you're thinking about, I would just ask you get in touch with our church leaders. We will make it happen for you. We have an annual meeting, right? On February 6th, that would make it a really wonderful Sunday. If you said, I want to get baptized, hey, we'll baptize you on February 6th. And then afterwards, we'll go all eat chili. So that'll be fun. I know there are some people that don't want to follow Jesus. They refuse. Because they know that if they follow Jesus, they would have to give things up. And they're right. When you come to Christ, you surrender your past. You surrender your life to God. But let me ask you, why do you want it? I mean, why do you want to keep your old life? When you look back on your life, what's back there that's so important to you? I mean, I understand that dying to self, that doesn't sound attractive, but do you really think the road you're on is going to lead to improvement? It's going to lead to change? We spend our whole lives accumulating and hoarding stuff, and it's all junk. And even though it is all junk, we can't imagine letting any of it go. We can't imagine our life without it. But think about it. Doesn't it make more sense that in order for your life to truly make a change, to truly turn around, and the only way to grab the life that you were actually born for is to allow your old life to die. Change your mind. Do a 180. 
turn that car around, choose a new road. You are not an old dog. Change is possible. New life is possible. In Acts chapter 8, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go to the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone explains it to me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, and so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth and began with the scripture. He told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? What a great question. Right? What a great question. The road ahead of you is new. New life awaits you. Look, here is water. What keeps you from it? Let's pray together. Lord, these past two weeks, we've been looking at the symbols behind communion, the bread and wine that we take, behind baptism, the water. Lord, these elements are things that we see in our church all the time, things that we grew up with, images that we recognize as being Christian, and yet they point to your Son. They are not just things that we do. These are truths that teach us about your son's life. They teach us doctrine. They teach us theology. They teach us about you. Lord, when each new person is baptized, we should shout and cheer and applaud for each time communion is taken all across the world. We should celebrate that the news of Jesus' cross is still preached in the world. Lord, each one here is a minister. Each one here is an evangelist. Each one here is a prophet. May this year be us preaching your son, teaching the world who he was, and letting them know that new life is available for them. May your church continue to preach, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand until the day your son returns. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. We're so glad to see you. Of course, we would love to see you here. We would love to have you here in church. We've got lots of room for you, and we'd love to see you back. We've got two services every Sunday, one at 930. We have a choir, and we sing traditional hymns, and we have a service at 11 o'clock, which is more contemporary. We have a worship team, and during that hour, we also have a full children's program and youth group. We also have youth group every Wednesday night as well. 6 p.m., you can send your kids over to the church, send them over on their skateboard or their bike, We will even feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. They can hang out with their friends, any kids from sixth grade through high school. uh, We'd love to have them. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.